Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second virtual meeting of the um, Royal Met Society's Lo Southeast Local Centre meeting. Um, I'll take my time with the intro to allow uh, other people to attend, but today's virtual meeting is our postgraduate student showcase that normally we've had in the autumn term, but obviously 2020, 2021 is not quite what it is, but we still have two postgraduate post student prize winners from the Reading University Met Department and we'll have Simon Lee and we'll have Alex Doyle both of whom I've known since they were undergraduates but we'll come to them later let's go through our, my sort of pre-talk and then I'll have, we'll do a little weather summary as I normally do and those people that have been to the real life as I shall call it Southeast Local Centre meetings will have seen me do there. So <coughs> Oh, I see. Uh, hello to Barry, who said hi, uh, hi from Coulsdon, which sounds worryingly like one of the rain gauges that I was having trouble with with my data this afternoon. So um, hello. Um, everybody feel free to say hello in the chat and so on and ask questions as we go. I'll be asking questions of our speakers and answering for myself. So please use the chat, say hello and ask your questions in there. So first up, join the weather club. It's free. So the Royal Met Society's Weather Club gives you access, so you get full access to the website, you get information about events and meetings on the weather, you get opportunities to participate in national activities, so that includes the Great British Weather Experiments and competitions, and <clears throat> make sure you speak to the experts about the, we the weather. And <clears throat> there's the new quarterly newsletter with lots of weather news stories and short features. Um, so become a member of the Met Society, Royal Met SOC. Um, I'm sure everybody already is a member of the Royal Meteorological Society because of all the fabulous things that you get. But anyone who is, who is interested or involved in meteorology can and should join the historic world leading society. The worldwide membership with professionals, academics, students, teachers, enthusiasts and observers. And who isn't an enthusiast about the weather really? We all experience it. So. Um, come join um it's lovely to see lots of people saying where they're coming from um so we we do seem to be mostly southeast today so but devon well devon well, hello len clearly not actually but if you're in devon clearly not southeast but welcome visitor virtual visitor to the southeast um so if once you become a member then <clears throat> You get you get uh, the monthly weather magazine. Um, I should say that Simon, our first speaker, can tell you all about the weather magazine, but I'll leave I, I'll leave that out. But you can get the weather magazine on all of the different routes. Um, get discounts at conferences and uh, and paid meetings, discounts on the journals, and access to support grants and so on. And there's lots of other benefits. So click uh, go to that website, which you can't click on here, but I'm sure you can remember the rmets.org and it, click on the membership and you can learn all about <coughs> the um all about that so more hellos to people saying hello um <coughs> so we're going to have a qa session i think what we'll what we're going to do is we'll have simon's talk and then a short q and a session for simon we'll have alex's talk and then a short q and a session and if anybody's got any questions i think what the might they might have more sort of generically about PhD students and so on, then perhaps we could have either of them answer towards the end. Um, and of course, I'm going to give my little weather briefing. So also, if you've got any questions, I will try and answer any that come up. I'll try and do it live off the chat because it tends to work a little bit better like that. So if you've got any questions as I present my little weather briefing or any comments, please say them in the chat. I shall try and tell you about that. But we'll have those Q&A sessions, put them in the chat particularly for Simon and Alex's talk, if you think of the question as you're going through, I'll save the questions, mark, I'll mark the questions off so we can save them for the Q&A session. So please ask your questions in the chat. Right. Um, there, here's for some top tips for using Demio. Um, for anyone that hasn't used Demio before, so you can access the chat up in the top right corner. You can sort of adjust basically make the slides bigger and probably a good idea when you've got me on screen make me as small as possible particularly because i'm sat in my dining room you get a fun experience of my bicycle to my left and a fish tank to my right occasionally you'll see a very bright blue fish swim by <coughs> um, 
and yeah, ask your questions in the chat when you have them. And on that, I guess I'll go into what I, sort of the first talk, which is myself talking about the weather summary for, and I thought this time last, last month, I talked about what happened in 2020 as a whole for the year. This time I thought we'll go slightly smaller scale and go for the winter of 2020, 21. So obviously we are in climatological spring. I spent my lunch, my, my lunch today out just outside those windows that you can see the curtains from, um, cutting back and a vast quantity of hedge, which is definitely going green now. So spring has sprung in my back garden and it was positively lovely. So we can look back and look at the meteorological winter and see what's happened, basically. So first, I've gone to the UK as a whole view. And you can see here the mean temperature trend. Um, of recent years, sort of recent times, so an upward trend, as I guess nobody is surprised by. And the most recent year, so 2021, 20, <clears throat> what we can see that actually we had a latest value that was very slightly below average, so about 3.5 degrees C mean temperature over the UK, very slightly colder than average, but it really is only slightly. And that's on the 1981 to 20, 20, 2010 trend. I guess that's because we didn't have a winter 2020 yet. So that hasn't <coughs> moved up. Um, I have actually done the equivalent 2021, uh, 2020 version for the Reading stats, just because I thought they'd be interesting. And you'll see I've done some comparisons later on some of the others because we are in a new 30 year climate period this year. So the amount of the of rainfall this winter was slight was this time slightly above almost exactly 400 for the UK as a whole so a nice convenient n number there um so a little bit wetter but absolutely nothing to write home again about in fact I should go back and point out that we're a bit colder but it's nothing it was nothing desperately unusual again the rainfall nothing desperately unusual and the sunshine was a little bit un a little bit down on average um recent really the last few years have been really quite sunny so being a bit down on average over a whole season seems somewhat surprising and to me it's kind of felt like a pretty dull winter but i guess what i've learned there is that i can't remember how dull winters are meant to be or normally are it shows we all have short memories um <clears throat> Then I've got the maps. So the Met Office make these of these rather nice maps for the climate summaries. And so I've got the left. So the left side here, I've got the winter mean temperature anomaly. Based on the 1981 to 2010 anomaly. And you can see there that basically it's all very average. Scotland was a little bit colder than average, which for a whole season is feels really quite unusual to say. I did think it was quite nice to show that we all we hopefully everyone in this meeting knows that climate change is happening. So I did the same plot and compared it to the 1961 to 1990 averages and work out that anomaly. Well, of course, suddenly now, basically the entire south of England becomes anomalously warm and that Scottish cold becomes perfectly normal. So that shows you how what's been a slightly colder than average winter actually would have been slightly warmer than average only sort of within my lifetime. So definitely surprising. Um, next up, I've got the rainfall amount and the sunshine amount. So left rainfall, right sunshine. Um, what struck me really on this one was the rainfall patterns got this stripe down the east. So it's clearly the east coast has seen more rain and significantly more rain. There's been more rain over almost everywhere other than the northwest of Scotland. Of course, what's most important about that is if you actually show the absolute rains, you can't really tell that there's anything missing in the northwest of Scotland. It's just normally so wet that it not being it being a bit drier than average, it's still really wet. Um, and then there's this big stripe that doesn't quite run down the east coast. And I think this is because we've had a lot more easterly winds coming in. And bringing showers and so on in off the in off the North Sea, and perhaps they've been a bit more they've been penetrating inland a bit more than they normally do, and what, that's why we've got that stripe where it is. What I noticed particularly was that pattern seems to be there on all three individual months as well. It's not that it happened in one month particularly strongly and then didn't 
and then it's shown through on the summer season and uh, winter season. And you do see this where a single storm can go through and leave a stripe across the country on these maps when there's a lot of rain. It doesn't, that doesn't seem to have been the case. It seems to have persisted for all three months. Um, I also, as I've often pointed out in these meetings in real life, what on earth happened in Newbury? Uh, without being able to use my pointer, hopefully you can all spot Newbury is that little brown point where suddenly it's got about 50% of the rainfall it would normally get over winter in a sea of everywhere being wetter than normal. So um, no idea. It does seem to be Newbury. Um, the other sort of take home really is the south has been quite dull. And Scotland, and particularly the really far north of Scotland, has been very, very sunny. I guess very, very sunny as a comparative term compared to normal. So that is the UK as a whole. <clears throat> I've then gone on to look at Reading, and I use Reading because that's where I'm based. It's where I'm sat right now, and I've got quick access to our climatological and daily data. And so these are our averages for the winter. Our average T max of 8.13, which is slightly, so 0.18 degrees C, more <clears throat> um, colder than average. Then two for the minimums and five for the means. Again, slightly, just under 0.2 degrees colder than average. Um, rainfall, 195.9 uh, is 13% wetter than a normal winter, but 13% is not massive and 150 hours is only 16% down on the anomalies. <clears throat> um, and I, I made an error last, last month in that I said that I will always try and find some kind of record on these. And it's been a remarkably unrecord breaking winter. Um, the best I could come up with was we did have the coldest mean Tmax since 2010. So for 10 years, but it's not exactly special and it didn't it wasn't actually a particularly cold T min or T mean. It didn't go anywhere near such so, so far back as 10 years. So there wasn't anything there. Now, it's probably worth noting that I did use the 1991 to 2020 averages when I calculated this. And I guess I can argue whether I should have done because December 2020 was included in this winter. Um, that's how I calculated my anomalies. But I thought it was worth pointing out that the temperature difference in the 1991 to 2020 average for winter compared to the 1981 to 2010 climatological average was about 0.3 degrees warmer in all three of the max, min and mean categories. It wasn't quite 0.3, but it was very close. And so actually, although I've said that all of our temperatures were a little bit cold compared to normal. If I'd done them to the 20, the 1981 to 2010 averages, we'd have been very slightly warmer than average. So an interesting point. I've had absolutely no comments in the chat at all about the weather, about my weather briefing, which either means everybody's fallen asleep or I've been so clear and amazing that you've got no questions so i'm going to hope it's the i'm going to hope it's the first one because i can see that we have got attendees still <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you simon who tells me i'm clear and amazing i'm, I'm not quite sure i shall agree with him <clears throat> um, so oh those are my annual ones from last month that's what happened so i think i need to move on <clears throat> oh, the, the, Brian, Brian Durham is asked why there is a bike in my living room, which is, to be fair, an excellent question. And he's done well. To, he's done well. There is a bike. There's actually three bikes in my living room. It's because my house is small and I have too many bicycles. <clears throat> and yeah, William, completely agree. It was a remarkably unremarkable winter, basically. I didn't even quite manage. I did. I have did even try and see if it was the most average winter we'd had in Reading. And it wasn't even the most average winter. So bit of a fail there. Um, so, <clears throat> and Scotland apparently has had an amazing ski season with lots of snow. So, <clears throat> yeah. And Alex has pointed out, uh, to related to the bicycle, he first met me at the University of Reading's Road Bike Cycling Club. So that is why. It's because my office is right next to my bicycles and my office has suddenly 
well suddenly nearly a year ago had to be able to cope with two people working from home not one so um that's how i end up with bikes in shot um so i think we need to move on to simon i'm actually going to scroll all the way back to the first slide of this so we can see our speaker's name again and I can read you out my little bio of Simon. Now, Simon sent me two bios. The temptation to read the first one he gave me, which was a bit more, um, I won't be that mean to him, and, so, and, read, and read out the second. <clears throat> so si Simon's a final year PhD student working on stratosphere troposphere coupling and subseasonal seasonal predictions. Uh, he was an MMET graduate, so he did his year in Oklahoma. <clears throat> at the University of Reading and he's now the co-editor in chief of weather and he now includes a smiley face at this point. Simon do a smiley face for me. Yeah excellent well done. Um, he tells us he grew up in Harrogate North Yorkshire and probably first became interested in weather age six through a fascination with varying water levels in various local reservoirs. Now I'm not quite going to let him get away and start talking now because I also became interested in weather when I was age six. But my one was because it was the first thing I ever remember. It was the great storm, 1987. And so Simon and I, clearly, we were at age six is the time to get into meteorology. And with that note, I shall hand you over to Simon, who hopefully can take over. The, the great intro there, Rob. Um, and I certainly think that, yeah, six is, is an age where you're, some, some interest can just get stuck. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, what happened during winter 2019, 2020. So casting your mind back to not last season, but the equivalent the year before. And uh, of course, the, the most memorable thing that happened during winter 2019, 20 was uh, the outbreak of our, our viral foe. Um, but it wasn't the, the, the only interesting thing to happen. And hopefully I'll convince you of that tonight. So this is some work which uh, I led um, with uh, a variety of authors from from different parts of the world. So Zach Lawrence and Amy Butler, both in uh, in the NOAA PSL and CSL in Boulder, Colorado, and Alexi Karpechko uh, from the Finnish Meteorological Institute in Helsinki, and uh, and, and also this uh, I should credit some of the some of the others who uh, have contributed to, to some of the work that I'll show tonight. So, uh, what 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 happened in in 2019-20? Well, we're, we've already sort of seen and alluded to some of this. And, and it's easy to remember that it was an exceptionally wet winter and an exceptionally mild winter in, in the UK. And particularly in February, as you can see uh, in this figure on the left with the red arrow indicating that the UK had its, its wettest February um, on the HAD UK grid data set since, since at least 1862. And, and, and quite far above um, the, the average, which is just under 100 millimetres of rain. And, and this was over 200 and a lot of that rain fell as from storms Kira and Dennis uh, and then in the, in the right hand panel we're looking at uh, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies uh, data set showing the the mean temperature anomalies across the globe relative to the 1991 to 2020 average I should say uh, so this doesn't look as warm as, as some global temperature figures uh, but still as a whole the whole globe was 0.55 Celsius above this average but particularly the Northern Hemisphere mid-latitudes were very, very warm. So North America for DJF 2020 was one to two degrees above uh, the most recent 30-year average. And then you can see that for Eurasia, the temperatures were widely more than two Celsius above that most recent 30-year average. And then for, for parts of Siberia, reaching six Celsius above the most recent 30-year average. So this was a really extreme state, not just for the UK, uh, and, and not just not just for, for for Europe or anywhere, but really across the across the whole globe, across the whole northern hemisphere, and and really the only place that that shivered and uh, uh, quite a lot during during that winter was was Alaska, which you can also see there that, that had uh, an unusually cold winter. So this is this is what we're we're going to focus on tonight, which is uh, this this unusual circulation pattern that persisted through the winter. And and I'd also like to add that. That this was really the, the precursor to the Siberian heat wave that persisted through most of 2020 and, and was associated with the exceptionally high temperatures and wildfire outbreaks during the summer. So uh, this, this pattern that we had during winter 2020, as I'll refer to it, was uh, the extremely positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation, or the AO. 
So the Arctic Oscillation is this leading mode of, of surface pressure variability in the northern hemisphere poleward of 20 north. And it's essentially characterized by uh, a dipole between the pressure over the Arctic and in the mid latitude. So in the positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation, the, the pressure is lower than normal over the Arctic uh, and higher than normal in the mid latitudes and the jet streams and the storm tracks shift further poleward. And in the negative phase, you have the inverse of that. And this is the, the, the primary way in which the Northern Hemisphere weather patterns vary um, during, during winter time. And so uh, what happened during winter 2020 was that the positive AO reached record amplitude and persistence of this positive phase for, for January to March. And, and a lot of what I'll talk about tonight is mainly focusing on this January to March period. It's a th three month period, so it's sort of a season. I'm aware it doesn't align up quite with the typical DJF, but really this extreme period that we had was, was during uh, January to March. And so the figure here is uh, from a paper that Zach uh, Lawrence led that I was look at, luckily enough to be a co-author on, um, which came out in JGR last year. Uh, and in the, in the figure on the left, we see what the sea level pressure anomaly looked like during January to March 2020. And, and this pattern, this, this, these lower than normal pressures over the Arctic, and the, the, the higher than normal pressure in the Atlantic um, uh, west of Spain, and then also this ridge anomaly in the North Pacific, that's characteristic of, of essentially what the positive Arctic oscillation phase looks like. It, it projects very strongly onto that pattern. And then the time series on the right with the, the two arrows, so the, the panel B is showing the, the time series going back to 1950 on the NOAA Climate Prediction Center Index. So you see that the, the rank uh, was, was top for this entire period of a, of a standard deviation of 2.7. Um, and the, the only really comparable winters in terms of this index are 1989 and 1990. But in terms of the number of days with the index greater than one, a, a, a absolutely extraordinary number of 56 days out of those three months uh, and, and well above any previous winter in the record. And it wasn't just at the surface that this that, that, that we had this unusually strong positive pattern with with these strong jet streams, and, and actually it was vertically deep and extended through the depth of, of the atmosphere into the with the and it was intimately tied with the stratospheric polar vortex. So the the strength of the stratospheric polar vortex is is closely related to the positivity, so to speak, of the Arctic Oscillation at the surface. And when the stratospheric polar vortex is strong, typically the Arctic Oscillation is in its positive phase. And that's what we saw during the winter of 2020. Now, what, what's shown here is the average, is the, the geopotential height anomalies uh, for the polar cap averaged over 60 to 90 north, according to ECMWF 05 reanalysis. And it's a, a time height cross section uh, from October 2019 through to the end of May 2020. Uh, and you can see the, the troposphere up to about 100 or so hectopascals and the stratosphere beyond that. And so where blue is shown, this indicates that the pressure is lower than normal inside the vortex, uh, that the vortex is strong and cold, and that essentially this Arctic oscillation pattern is positive. And so you can see that as, as we progressed through November and December, there was a lot of variability and nothing really too persistent. In fact, actually in, in December, there was a minor warming of the stratospheric vortex that, that propagated down through December, and we can see that impacting the surface weather patterns. But then once we got to January, there was this huge switch and the vortex just switched uh, throughout the column into this strong mode and then really enhanced and intensified as we move through February and into March, where, where this reached record cold levels and the extremely cold conditions inside the stratospheric vortex were actually associated with unprecedented ozone depletion, uh, which, which is rare in the Northern Hemisphere uh, for the vortex to get that cold. So we have this, this intense vortex, this intense positive Arctic oscillation right through the depth of the column. And, and what we can see is, is some, uh, some maps of that shown here from Enter Benkar reanalysis of what I call a vertically deep extreme climate state. The left-hand figure is showing the anomalies up at 10 hectopascals, in the middle at 100 hectopascals, and at the right at 1,000 hectopascals. And essentially what you see is this big blue blob centered over the pole, uh, or purple, uh, in all three of the figures, indicate, uh, indicating a very strong vortex right through the column of the atmosphere. Uh, and, and you really see why this is this pattern is also known as the northern annular mode, because it's, it's 
evidently, and the other. So the, the key thrust of what I'm talking about now is, is how well we were able to predict this, which is what we investigated uh, in our research. And to do that, we looked at the seasonal forecast that comprised the Copernicus Climate Change Service database, or C3S database. And six, but now seven, uh, forecasting centers from around the world contribute data to C3S. So aside from the ones in the UK, which are ECMWF and the Met Office, there's also contributions from NOAA, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, Meteor France, uh, CMCC, which is in Italy uh, and stands for the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change in Italian, I think, um, and then uh, DWD in Germany. And so the, these forecasts, oh, and, and, and now there's JMA that also contribute. So, the, so these forecasts uh, are contributed in terms of the real time, the operational forecast, the model run, uh, which is available every 13th of the month, but also, and importantly for what I'll talk about, hindcasts, which are also known as re-forecasts. And what these are is when you rerun your current model that you have, but you initialize it at a date in the past, so let's say 20 years ago, uh, and you run that forecast to see what it would have done, what it would have predicted if you had this model 20 years ago. Uh, and then you build up by running that over this 20 year period or so, an idea of what the model climate is. That's what the model would normally do. And that enables you to compute an anomaly and to see how different your model is currently forecasting compared with how the model would normally forecast in its default state. And that enables you to remove the influence of any biases uh, in, in the model's mean state, um, which means that what you see are the forecast anomalies with respect to what the model would normally do. And that, that's really important. And so for, for Copernicus data, it's all over this anomaly period of 1993 to 2017. Um, it, it, ideally, we would love if these were longer hindcast periods, but it's computationally expensive to, to rerun all these reforecasts. So uh, most, operat mo most operational forecasting centers run for a smaller period like uh, what we have here. And, and there's a link there, which you obviously can't click, but um, if you do a bit of Googling, you can access charts from these forecasts uh, free every month. So do check those out. It's really, it's a really cool thing to be able to see. And um, so uh, I've touched on this a little bit, but seasonal forecasting, wh what you do is you initialize your model uh, from the current state of the atmosphere and generate an ensemble of, of different members which have different things perturbed in the initial conditions and in the model representation of, of the world um, to account for the uncertainty in both the initial conditions and the model's ability to represent the atmosphere as the ocean system. And then you run that forecast model much the same as you would run a weather forecasting model for the length of the season. Compare the output of that forecast with the model's climatology, with what the model would normally do. Uh, and then you that's where the human bit comes in. You interpret that output. You say, well, why is it saying what it's saying? And so the, the things that I want to, to emphasize now is that a model is not perfect. And I'm sure I don't need to convince anyone of that, but obviously we, we have limitations in what we're able to do computationally with limitations in our own knowledge um, and, and, and others. Um, but the, the other thing which I think is often forgotten is that predictability itself is not constant, even with a perfect model. So even if you had a perfect model, sometimes you just wouldn't be able to predict the weather as accurately as others. And, and that's, that's a much greater truth of the atmosphere, which I, th I think is, is sometimes brushed under the rug by some of this idea that models just can't forecast the weather. Sometimes the predictability is what's letting you down. And then you have the ensemble mean signal, uh, which is always small relative to the real world anomalies because it's a, you, you've got this huge spread of solutions from the ensemble. The predictable signal in that is always going to be much smaller. And that doesn't mean that, that, that if the real signal is much bigger that the model has failed. You just need to interpret it in terms of how much of a deviation from normal um, your, your ensemble mean signal is. And typically, we'll see later on, but small perturbations can be quite significant. And driving all of this is the, the fact that some things in the Earth system vary more slowly. So things like sea surface temperatures, they change on timescales of months and are able to consume the forecast um, uh, over these seasonal timescales. And, and one of those, the most famous of which, and uh, uh, an absolute bastion of, of seasonal predictability is the El Nino Southern Oscillation because it has such huge ramifications on, on the climate patterns around the world. So this is what we, uh, this is what was forecast for, for last winter. So what I'm showing here are the predictions from 
that were initialized on the 1st of December 2019 um, for, for January to March. So we're considering the typical sort of one month before the three month season that you're looking at. And so what's shown is the, the, the ensemble mean 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomalies for the Northern Hemisphere for each of the models. MMM, that stands for multi-model mean, so that's the average of panels A to F. And then era five reanalysis is what actually happened in panel H. And in all of these, uh, so what you can see straight off, I hope, is that they're all very similar to each other. So th there was clearly something that was pulling all the models towards the same answer. Um, but also what you will see here is that the, on the anomalies in the models versus the real world are around three times weaker. And that's this idea that the ensemble mean signal is, is weaker um, than the real world. But they're all predicting a positive Arctic oscillation. They all have this blue, this lower geopotential heights over the Arctic uh, and, and reds around that, um, which is good, uh, except for this Meteor France model, which, which doesn't predict a positive Arctic oscillation. It has higher than normal heights of the central Arctic. And, and that's really interesting. Uh, and we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later. The number in the top right hand corner is, is just the anomaly correlation coefficient between the predicted um, map, essentially, and what happened in panel H. And so you can see actually that the, what performed the best was the multi-model mean with uh, this, uh, this anomaly correlation of 0.76. And, and that's probably because this, this is, you're getting the best, uh, the, the most predictable pattern by averaging over different, different forecast members. Uh, but there's a very high for all of them. Uh, and then you can see that Meteor France um, is much lower because it doesn't have this positive Arctic oscillation. So then you might ask, well, how, how did the forecast perform in October and November? Well, it, broadly, they actually performed worse, as you might expect. This is a greater lead time. Uh, so there's more uncertainty. But the actual, the, actually, that wasn't true for the Met Office, which, which had it, the most accurate forecast of any of these were the ones initialized in October and November. Uh, and it was actually did slightly worse in, in December initialization date. So clearly in this winter, something was very well picked up by quite a lot of the models. It's an incredibly long lead time for October to get to get that right then really is quite astonishing. Uh, and the, the Glossy 5, the Met Office system, picked this up better than the others. So how does this compare with previous years? Now, bear with me because there's a, a, quite a bit going on on this figure. So what we want to do is we want to compare this anomaly correlation coefficient that I mentioned for the 2020 winter with how the model would have done in the past. So the hindcast for these winters of 1994 to 2017. Now, the uncertainty in terms of these dotted lines around the dashed line, that's coming from the fact that the, the number of ensemble members that contribute to the real time forecast for 2020, there's more ensemble members there. So we have to do a bit of uh, resampling to account for that um, because the, the hindcasts have smaller ensembles because it, it saves computational resource. Uh, so effectively, the takeaway from this is, is really that the, the, the dashed line generally lies above most of the previous winters for most of the models, except for, again, Meteor France that, that didn't quite get this pattern right. So what we know is that this was an unusually well predicted winter. Um, but what was also true about the winter was that it didn't have an El Nino or a La Nina event. And typically the best predicted winters, so some of those include uh, 1998, for example, um, have a, a large El Nino event to constrain the forecast. So this, this was another thing that was really interesting. This was a really predictable winter in the absence of the key source of seasonal predictability in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, as I've mentioned, the stratosphere was also in an unusual state during this winter. And so what we wanted to see was whether this, the, there was a relationship in the accuracy of the forecast in the troposphere with the accuracy of the forecast in the stratosphere. And so this figure here is showing the error in the Arctic oscillation uh, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it's the error in the 10 hectopascal 60 north zonal mean zonal wind, so the, the strength of the stratospheric vortex. And then uh, in, in dots are all the individual ensemble members from the forecast systems contributing to this database. And for most of the models, again, except for this Meteor France model that just did something very different, what we see is that the, the, the forecast which more closely captured the accuracy of the Arctic oscillations positivity were also tended to have a lower error in the stratosphere. So this through the winter. So this suggests um, 
that there was some kind of relationship going on in the forecasts. And, and these are very strong correlation coefficients of, of around 0 0.64, 0 0.65, 0 0.68 even in ECMWF across all the ensemble members in that prediction system, uh, showing that there were, even though the ensemble means were were pretty good, that, that there was this, this, um, this greater piece of information you could extract from the ensemble. But how, I ask? So generally the strength of the stratospheric vortex is determined by how much vertically propagating Rossby wave activity leaves the troposphere and is able to enter the stratosphere. And when these waves propagate up into the stratosphere, they grow to large amplitude and they, and they break like a wave breaking on a beach. It really is quite that, almost quite that simple. Uh, and they warm the polar vortex and decelerate it. So to get a very strong polar vortex, it typically means that the amount of wave activity is suppressed. And it turns out that the amount of wave activity in, in the winter was unusually low. And um, what we find is that the, um, the, there was a, a, a correlation between the, the predicted pattern in the troposphere and its ability to suppress wave activity, um, leading to a, to a stronger stratospheric vortex in the forecasts. So in, in this panel A, the, the black contours are showing the mean wave field uh, in the northern hemisphere during winter dashed negative and so if you have essentially blues overlying where it's uh, solid contours and reds overlying where it's dashed contours that indicates that the, the the forecast with the stronger vortex have higher geopotential heights there and that that indicates suppression of this wave activity these waves uh, leading to less wave activity and, th and that's indeed what we see that the forecasts which had uh, this, for example, this ridge in the North Pacific that destructively interferes with the climatological uh, sort of Aleutian low region, and this this Ural trough as well, this blue region near Scandinavia, that they when they had that pattern earlier in the winter, they had a stronger stratospheric vortex later in the winter, and then on the right we see effectively a similar thing that the when they had a stronger stratospheric vortex, they had lower geopotential height uh, over the Greenland region and higher geopotential heights over the central North Atlantic. And that's indicative of this positive North Atlantic oscillation, positive Arctic oscillation type pattern. So we have this two way coupling, get the troposphere right, you get the stratosphere right, and then you get the troposphere a bit more right as well. So there's this, this two way interaction during the winter. And then uh, th this obviously immediately asked the question, well, where was the tropospheric skill coming from? That's not something which we particularly touched on. Uh, but Stephen Hardiman, in a, in a great paper in, in Atmospheric Science Letters, did some work to suggest that it was actually coming from this wave train that was emanating from the, the Indian Ocean Dipole event during late 2019. But that evidently, you still needed to capture this stratospheric component, which Meteor France didn't, um, in order to get an, a, a fully very accurate tropospheric forecast. And, and, and so that really um, emphasizes why you need to, to better model and represent the stratosphere in your seasonal predictions. So very quickly, uh, I just want to quickly look at uh, this winter, which didn't go quite so well. Again, as I mentioned, pre predictability is in constant. Uh, so the, the, the maps on the, the left two hand maps are the Met Office and ECMWF forecasts for DJF 2021. And you see the, the lower geopotential heights over the Arctic. Uh, and the ring of, of reds and higher geopotential heights around the mid latitudes is indicative of a positive Arctic oscillation. Uh, and then on the right, you see that what actually happened was uh, one of the most negative Arctic oscillations in, in recent years, since 2010, uh, with higher heights of the central Arctic. So the, the models got this wrong, um, which is on the back of, sort of great success, a bit disappointing, but we learn from these things. Um, and, and so what we had this winter was a strong La Nina event. That's good. It, we think that that should help constrain our forecasts and make it more accurate. But we also had this major sudden stratospheric warming event in January, and effectively they tug in opposite directions because La Nina winters tend to have a stronger stratospheric vortex leading to a positive Arctic oscillation, um, but, but a stratospheric warming would go the other way. And if you can't predict number two, then, then number one is going to, to be your overriding force and, and you land it with the wrong signal. But I thought it was interesting in this, this figure on the right that the forecast from ECMWF did suggest twice the climatological likelihood of a major SSW in January. It just wasn't enough of a signal. But there was something there, and I think that's interesting to investigate quite what those ensemble members, those 20% of the ensemble, 
we're seeing. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to learn a bit more about extracting predictability from that. Which brings me to the end. And so to, to, to wrap that up, that the winter of 2020 was an extreme event in the Northern Hemisphere extratropics, uh, but it was well predicted by the seasonal forecast models. It had this positive Arctic oscillation and strong stratospheric vortex. Uh, and, but then there is evidence of the importance of capturing a two-way interaction between the troposphere and stratosphere for the best forecasts. Uh, seasonal forecasts are not always accurate. We've seen that this winter. They, they have struggled because they, it seems, because they struggle to capture the sudden stratospheric warming. And um, so that leaves me with the take home message, which is that sometimes the atmosphere is more predictable than others. And sometimes we, our models are good enough and we, <laughs> and we, we can capture that. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions now. And, and also I would uh, recommend and going and checking out our paper in, in geophysical research letters, it is open access, so you don't need an institutional subscription to access it. Right. Some questions. Um, I guess quickly, remember to push the to one live. So which were the worst scenarios and which are the most annoying in terms of predictability. And I think I, I appreciate Len's use of the word annoying here, because I'm sure you and I both agree that annoying is what is the scenario is for predictability. I guess I'm going to term it slightly worse. If you wanted to design a situation that was going to give you the worst predictability, what would you do? <laughs> well, it, se it seems like what you would want to do would, would be to have what we've had this winter, is to have, a, have two things that go in opposite directions, have a La Nina and have a major sudden stratospheric warming. Um, that they will tug your forecast in opposite directions and the, the relative importances of them will will, will change uh, your outcome. So I think that's about as bad as it could get. Okay, fair enough. Um, William has asked you to give a, to give us all a reminder of what the Arctic Oscillation is. Had you got, a, I can't remember, did your first, one of your early slides, did it have the uh, EOF type? It, it does, can I, can I go to that? I, I, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure if you can. Oh. Eleanor might have to, but well, it looks like you can't. Oh, right. Excellent. And there we go. Look, Thank Eleanor's you. bringing you back. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, <laughs> so if you focus on the, the figure in, in the bottom left, that's, that's effectively, I know that's what happened in 2020, but that's effectively the pattern that the Arctic Oscillation is. Uh, so when it's in its negative phase, you would flip those colours round and have higher pressure over the central Arctic and lower pressure in the mid latitudes. And it's just the, the primary way in which the Northern Hemisphere surface pressure varies. Um, so, and it, it's also associated with that as the strength and the, the zonality, the westerliness of the jets. Okay, um, I think that was all of the questions that we spotted that came up in the chat for you, Si. Excellent. <clears throat> William, uh, William says, thank you for your thank explanation. You. So, thank you. Um, Obviously, if anyone has any more questions for Simon, they think of. Oh, there's a question from, there's a question from Barry. Shall so I just answer that? Oh, Barry is, yeah, you can. I'll, I'll, mark, well, I'll, I'll hit the answer it, but you can. So I'll, I'll read it out. The French model obviously got the wrong signals. Does it use the same data as the other models? And if so, wh why did it get it wrong? And I guess, therefore, the others not. So bro broadly speaking, it, it would use the same data. They, 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 they broadly all, all do. Um, and it's actually, it's a rather similar model uh, and it's co-developed actually with what ECMWF use. Really, it just means that there's either chance because you have to generate an, on, an ensemble through random distributions and maybe you just miss the true scenario or something is deficient in the way the model is represented and, and, and it's possible it maybe didn't have enough, a large enough vertical resolution to capture some of these these teleconnections, but um, I, I think I was at a conference a couple of months ago where at, um, a, and there was some research suggesting some of the stratospheric processes weren't properly being captured in the Meteor France model. So there's evidence something's, something's afoot. Okay, oh. brilliant. Well, I think we should probably get ready to swap yeah. over to Alex. So Simon better hide himself and Alex better unhide, I guess. Um, and I can introduce Alex. Um, Alex has gone for his bio he sent me. He's gone for a very The Sun style, but I'm going to ignore his The Sun style and not include his age. 
most importantly because he included it and when i got quoted in the sun they included my age and they never asked me and i don't know how they got it right <clears throat> so Alex Doyle is another final year PhD student and another MMET graduate who spent his, spent his year in Oklahoma sort of pretending he wasn't chasing tornadoes because they're not allowed to go chasing tornadoes. Um, <clears throat> and so again, his, his PhD and undergraduate were both at the University of Reading. Um, he then says that like many meteorologists, he enjoys the outdoors and he can't wait to play tennis again at the end of the month. Um, I personally can't wait for numerous things to restart at the end of the month, running where I can actually run with anyone other than my girlfriend being one of them. Um, <clears throat> deciding to research, he decided to research tropical weather because it seemed extreme and interesting, which seems like a good reason. And he is increasingly fascinated and confused in equal measures by weather radars. Um, knowing Alex from the radar group, weather radars are indeed confusing and fascinating as anyone who listened to my talk from about two years ago should remember so alex please tell us about the monsoon convection observed using doppler radars thanks rob um that's an interesting experience someone reading that out whilst you're uh, sitting there with your camera on um anyway i will um go ahead and, and, and tell you about some uh, monsoon convection observed using Doppler radars. Um, there'd be a bit of monsoon meteorology and there'd be a bit about Doppler radars. So there'd be a bit of mix of the two. So hopefully it's got something for everyone. Um, and so without further ado, hopefully all this works. Great. OK, so I'm sure that a lot of you are very familiar with the monsoon. Um, perhaps some of you are um, less familiar with it. I am always like to remind myself of quite how it um you know quite how it works myself because sometimes when you're doing a phd in something you can you can forget the basics and it's good to go back to them um and also just motivationally um uh, why is it important so we know it's the largest seasonal change in wind direction and precipitation seen worldwide um and uh this is quite sort of a commonly um quoted statistic that it brings more than 80 percent of india's annual rainfall in the sort of four month period from june to september and of course, that amount of rainfall um, has major consequences for the economy, um, uh, mostly from monsoon rains. Um, and I sort of quote it as a double edged sword here because, of course, the monsoon is vital for the Indian economy, for agriculture in particular, um, and just a major source of water. But of course, a bit too much water, not enough. Uh, monsoon droughts, monsoon floods um, it can be incredibly harmful. So it's, it's uh, you know, having a good monsoon year is, is something which is. Um, you know, can feel sometimes very much on a knife edge and you can get monsoon drought years and monsoon flood years, which are um, which are very harmful to the economy. And I've taken these uh, sort of uh, this from some lecture notes I had when I was an undergrad, um, just because I think it shows it very well. Um, hopefully you can just about see uh, if you've got good eyes that there's some sort of northeasterly uh, winds here um, coming from sort of the um, uh, sort of desert in the north and the Siberian high during December, January, February, um, which means there's not much rainfall going on. And then, of course, in uh, June, July, August and boreal summer, there's these sort of um, oceanic sort of winds, westerly, southwesterly, bringing lots of moisture um, associated with um, uh, the monsoon um, as we know it. Um, and I also just wanted to say that the population is ever growing in India. Um, it's about as large as it is in China now, and the population is projected to um, go beyond what it is in China and to reach about 1.6 billion by 2050. That's a lot of people, and you know there's immediate importance from the fact that this research, any monsoon research, of course, benefits um, a huge amount of people. Um, so the next thing I wanted to do was talk about um, Indian monsoon onset because I go on to speak a little bit more about that later on as well, um, and. Uh, some of you might know um, that uh, a very commonly uh, quoted date is the 1st of June, uh, which is uh, the average date that the monsoon arrives right at the southern tip of India or in the state of Kerala, uh, right in the 1st of June. Uh, this is a sort of year to year standard deviation of about seven days. And then the monsoon moves non steadily towards the northwest. Um, and I say, you know, non steadily, I put that in bold because that's kind of quite an important point. I'll speak more about that in the the next slide i think um and then the monsoon uh 
reaches the far northwest of the country um, and we say that the monsoon peak is typically on average around 15th of July. Uh, so it takes about a month of a month and a half for the monsoon to progress from the right of the south of the country to the northwest of the country. And many of us will be familiar with the sort of um, the idea of how a monsoon forms each year. It's an annual phenomenon, of course. Um, and this is sort of the simplistic model for what happens. We've got um, uh, in the springtime, so just about now, actually, um, from now onwards, the land really heats up um, in comparison to the surrounding Indian Ocean temperatures. Um, and you get this strong land sea temperature gradient. And of course, we know that warm air is less dense, which means that um, this heat low, uh, low level heat low um, develops um, in terms of pressure over the uh, over the Indian land surface. And this, of course, leads to a reverse on the low level winds um, or uh, they change direction and become westerly, southwesterly and uh, bring lots of moisture, which then condenses as convection. Um, so that's great. Um, that's, you know, quite well um, understood um, and uh, sort of these ideas which I've spoken about in terms of a large scale model for annual monsoon formation. Uh, those ideas are very much in sort of uh, seasonal prediction, more in Simon's territory. Um, those ideas are very much what the models will use. Um, but I'm more interested actually in, in, in the short term and what actually drives the monsoon forwards on smaller spatiotemporal scales. So here I've shown um, precipitation and low level winds um, from mid-May to mid-July. Um, for 2016. Um, don't worry about these dots. These are my radar sites, so, so just sort of ignore them for now. Um, but you'll see, oh yeah, and this purple dashed line, um, the purple dashed line on these plots, which you hopefully can see, is the um, northern limit of the monsoon uh, during those dates. Um, and you can see that, you know, this northern limit of the monsoon from mid-May to mid-July moves sort of from the southeast of the country uh, to the northwest of the country in that time. Um, but it's non-steady, it's not sort of this linear process, and we want to understand what actually drives the monsoon forwards on those small spatiotemporal scales. Great, so I'll speak a little bit more about the Indian monsoon progression and um, this sort of non-steady nature of its move towards the northwest, and what I really want to do and want to hammer home is the fact that the progression of the Indian monsoon from the south of the country to the northwest of the country is um, not only non-steady, but related to convection. And this is a figure from uh, Doug Parker in Leeds, um, Parker et al. 2016 um, in QJ, um, which uh, is a schematic uh, towards the end of his paper, which really shows um, this idea well. Um, so there's multiple important timescales of variability that increase complexity. Um, there's the diurnal cycle, which I'll show a little bit about in, um, later on. There's intraseasonal variability in forms of active and break periods. You might have heard of those, um, but I won't go so much into those today. Um, and then there's the progression of the monsoon, um, which is what um, I'm talking about right now. And the monsoon convection is interlinked with the progression of the monsoon. Um, so sort of if we look at this figure from Doug Parker, um, we see that these orange colors in the 1st of June, uh, so this is a cross section from the northwest to the southeast, um, and it's for 1st of June, sort of at the start of the monsoon and 15th of July um, uh, during peak monsoon. And we see that the orange colors are sort of dry, mid-level air around 600 hectopascals, uh, which reach quite far into, the, into India towards the Southeast. And this, um, this means, you know, limits the amount of convection you can have further, uh, further north. However, uh, and we see this precipitating convection is confined right to the southeast of the country at this time. However, by the 15th of July, we see there's a lot more precipitating convection and this dry air is eroded towards the northwest, retreats back towards the northwest. And this um, sort of echoes the monsoon moving towards the northwest. And what we, uh, what we see is that at the 1st of June, there's a lot of these sort of shallower convective clouds, not necessarily precipitating, but nonetheless, these shallower congestus, cumulus congestus type clouds are bringing lots of moisture into these mid-levels and actually act to erode this dry air towards the northwest. And so in this way, we see that convection in itself is driving the monsoon forwards. Um, and so that's why I say monsoon convection is interlinked with the progression of the monsoon. And these sort of uh, the two other plots lower down here are um, essentially showing the same thing from a 3D perspective. We see the low level winds um, 
uh, the blue arrows here, the low level winds from the west and southwest, and then the dry mid level winds from the northwest, which get gradually eroded backwards by the 15th of July. So that's really one of the main points I wanted to, to hammer home from this presentation. And we can see this uh, just looking at 2016 in particular, um, looking at era five data. Um, uh, so we're looking at here relative humidity uh, right around that region in the mid levels, which Doug Parker um, spoke about. And um, so again, we're looking at sort of these successive pentads from mid-May to mid-July. Um, and this monsoon onset line is the white dash line. And we can see these red colors are very much this wedge of dry air, which retreats towards the northwest. And then you might notice that into June that it then sort of makes a sudden reappearance. Uh, this is likely associated with some sort of break period. So it's important to note that it's not, again, um, a steady um, retreat of this dry mid-level air. Um, it's something that can be a bit um, bumpy. It can be a bit, um, the dry air can come back. It can suddenly move away. Um, and so this is why the monsoon progression is non-steady and hard to predict. Um, and so um, we can see that very much by looking at the relative humidity. And then these vectors here are the um, uh, moisture flux vectors in kilograms per meter per second. It's just how much moisture is moving where, essentially. Um, and we can see associated with the dry air, there's not very much moisture flux. Um, but what I wanted to point out from these vectors is that in advance of the northern limit of the monsoon, so further north and west of this white dash line, there is um, uh, quite strong moisture flux from the west and southwest. Um, and this very much supports the Parker hypothesis that there is moisture in advance of the northern limit of the monsoon, which is um, causing there to be shallow convection, cumulus congestus convection, which drives the monsoon forwards and eventually results in deeper convection and precipitation and the arrival of the monsoon in a region. And um, convection uh, is notoriously difficult to model, especially at global model resolutions that have to parameterize convections, convection. So basically, um, that's my big driving point for my whole project is that um, we care about convection because it drives the monsoon forwards and it's poorly modeled. Uh, so we need to look at it more in observations. Um, and that's where the radars come, come in. Um, so observations of monsoon convection are unfortunately historically lacking. Uh, we still only have meaningful forecast skill and models out to about four days. Um, there have been improvements in recent years. We've looked at um, convection increasingly from a satellite perspective, from the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission or from uh, GPM, um, which is uh, the, the successor to successor to trim um, but there's several advantages to radars um, and i point out a few here that they're much much cheaper um, they have longer lifetimes they uh, have higher horizontal resolution so we can um, analyze uh, sort of more small scale features in clouds and convective cells and they're increasingly more common in tropical locations um, so india in particular which i focus on has a growing operational weather radar network and if they're being used for now casting and forecasting which is what you probably imagine a radar is typically used for why can't we use them more for research uh, so step in radars um the hero everyone has been asking for and we see at the bottom here that um this is just in case you're interested this is very much what a radar looks like uh, especially in india they place them on top of a building so there's less ground clutter and then the dish the radar dish will be hidden inside this sort of protective uh, dome um, there. Okay, so we can observe monsoon convection using operational radars. Um, unfortunately, it's not easy. That's why they wanted me to look at it. And um, so I'll show you a bit about my radar network first. So this uh, figure shows uh, on the left the uh, radar network which I have access to. Don't worry about the different colors of the different sites. Um, but we can see that uh, there's good sort of um, coverage of radars across India. There's maybe not that many in the West Coast, unfortunately, there's just Mumbai, um, but generally quite a lot of radars. And so we can look at different regions of India and look at um, look at the ground, uh, look at the radars to see what's going on in that region. And we can see on the figure on the right, um, this is shown um, so that you can understand a bit about the different climate regions of India during the monsoon. Um, so a couple of regions to point out, you'll see this uh, region of very heavy rain right in the west coast where Mumbai is, 
that's associated with the Western Ghats Mountains um, and lots of um, heavy precipitation there. And then there's sort of a rain shadow region east of this in southeastern India. And then in northeastern India, many of you will know that northeastern India is, uh, you know, famously quoted as the wettest place on Earth in terms of it's got the highest annual summer precipitation. Um, and uh, we can sort of see that here, there's some dark blue colours with lots of uh, very um, moist winds coming off the Bay of Bengal here. And I have access to data from 17 Doppler weather radars from the 2016 monsoon season. So how do we observe convection with observe convection with radars? Um, I won't have time to really um, uh, go into detail about this, um, but just wanted to give a sort of overview um, of um, of of radars, how they scan, and and how we might look at convection with them. Uh, so most operational radars run what we call position plan indicator or PPI scans. So PPI scans sample the atmosphere at multiple elevation angles. Uh, so we can see here ten different elevation angles. Um, of these different colors from 0.2 to 21 degrees uh, with range from the radar. So of course they, um, the, the beam sort of uh, increases with height the further it gets from the radar. Um, so there's disadvantages and advantages to the scanning strategy. Um, but what we want to do is place this radar data, which is in polar coordinates in terms of azimuth, elevation and range into onto a 3D Cartesian grid, uh, because we want to be able to look at um, the height of cells um, and we also want to be able to find convection and so what we do is we find convective pixels at two kilometers um, which is this red line uh, which i've put on this plot is at about two kilometers um, and we find convective pixels there using radar reflectivity um, and you might be familiar with radar reflectivity um, but it's approximately proportional to sort of the diameter of particles to the power of six um, which um, which tells you that, of course, higher reflectivity values um, are going to be associated with heavier precipitation, of course. And uh, we know that convective precipitation is typically associated with bigger raindrops. Uh, anyone who's been in a storm will know, wow, these raindrops are really big. Um, and so we can basically, it's a little more nuanced and complicated, but we can basically set a threshold of reflectivity and say, we think anything over this reflectivity value is convective. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the idea of how we find convection. And then a convective cell is any connected set of convective pixels. Um, so we've got a bunch of convective pixels we find at two kilometers, and then if they're joined up, they become a cell of a certain size. And then finally, we can give each cell a cell top height, uh, which is basically, again, is slightly more uh, nuanced, but it's the height of the highest meteorological reflectivity value in, in the cell from the radar. Um, so we've already got a lot of information there. We've got the size of the cell, we've got a number of convective cells, we've got the height of the cells, and that already can tell us a lot about actually the meteorology of the region, uh, which is what I quickly do here. Um, and um, so what I've shown here are some diurnal cycles for three different radar sites. So I've shown Chennai, um, Machilipatnam, which are, so those two sites are right in the southeast of India, sort of in that rain shadow region I was talking about, but on the coast. And then Mumbai is in that west coast, of course. Um, and this blue line is GPMIMO precipitation, which is a really good comparison. You can already see a first look, um, great, my radar is doing something correct. Um, now, we are analysing patterns in these convective cells with different radars, and just to remember that we're only looking at 2016 data here. Um, so I've sort of already said that. Now, um, Chennai and Mashilipatnam here are, we see this afternoon peak in convection um, over land, um, shown by these red circles here, um, which is quite clear. And however, over the ocean, it's much more of a nighttime or early morning peak in convection. And we see that um, also in these uh, in these colours in terms of the number of cells at different times. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is also about the heights of the cells. So we see it in this histogram towards the left of each axis. Um, we see that at Mumbai, the heights of the cells are typically very shallow. And the reason we think for that um, is that because of the Western Ghats Mountains, the effect of the Western Ghats Mountains, it means that raindrops in convective cells over the western coast of India um, grow in size very quickly uh, due to orographic enhancement 
Um, and those raindrops go very quickly and um, it means clouds rain out very quickly before they actually grow to a very deep level. So we think that over the western coast of India, clouds are typically not that deep. Um, they're very shallow, but they still precipitate um, a lot and very, very heavy precipitation um, compared to other regions. And for example, southeastern India, where um, you get more in the way of deep convection than you do at Mumbai. Um, so those are a couple of a couple of things to point out there. Of course, there's a lot to take away from from these figures, um, but hopefully those are some interesting points. Um, and sort of one more set of results I wanted to show, um, hopefully I'm keeping vaguely to time. Um, so I'm showing three sites again here. I'm sorry, it's quite small. Uh, there's Mumbai in the middle here um, and there's Agatala to the left, which is right in the northeast of India, right in that northeastern region, lots of rainfall. And Nagpur in the right. Um, hopefully our Indian meteorology is good, but that's in the, uh, that's in the, um, Indian geography is good rather, but Nagpur is in the north of the country. Um, and so what I've shown here is congestus cells shown by the orange line, which are all cells with a cell to pipe between five and eight kilometers, and deep cells shown by the red line, which is all cells with a cell to pipe greater than eight kilometers. And again, I've shown GPMI mode precipitation in blue as a comparison. And then this black dashed line is the date of monsoon onset for that site. Um, and don't worry about these gray shaded regions, that's just where I have a lack of radar data. Um, so what we've done here is we've looked at patterns of convection in the days and weeks around monsoon onset at each site. Um, so we've split convection into these two categories, as I mentioned. Um, Agatala in northeast India um, is very much has a lot of convection even before the monsoon onset um, with a peak around the onset date or just before the onset date, um, shown by this red line. Um, and so that's just to basically say it's a misconception to think that when the monsoon arrives, it's been really dry for weeks beforehand and then suddenly it's wet. A lot of these regions will have lots of convection in advance of the monsoon and will have rainfall. Um, and that leads you into a whole discussion about how you define monsoon onset, which I won't go into. It's a bit of a minefield. Um, Mumbai only has, in contrast, a little bit of convection before um, the monsoon onset date and then lots of convection afterwards. That's quite a simple case. That's a really nice case. You get lots of convection around the onset date and then more convection after the onset date. And Nagpur is sort of an in-between case. There's some convection of congestus and deep types before the monsoon onset and then more um, in the way, uh, more in the way of convection afterwards. Um, and we see that this pre-monsoon convection at Nagpur and Agatala, perhaps that's the kind of convection which does drive that dry air, which I spoke about towards the Northwest um, and erodes that dry mid-level relative humidity um, that Doug Parker in his, in his paper spoke about. Um, thus advancing the monsoon forward. So we do sort of see that here. Um, and I cover all this in a bit more detail in in, in, in a paper which is uh, currently in review in weather um, and uh, will hopefully be in the student conference issue later this year. So do give that a read if you pick it up. Um, and of course, it will be available online as well. Um, so I'll cover it and I cover this in more detail there as well as this whole monsoon onset definition conundrum. Um, so that sounds great, hopefully. What next? Um, so uh, we want to look more at how this is represented in models, uh, compare all these ground radar observations to Met Office Unified Model Runs, which uh, are available for the 2016 season. Uh, the diagnostics in this model include radar reflectivity. So we want to see, um, do we have similar statistical patterns? Do we have comparable diurnal cycles? Um, as I've shown today, for example, um, how well is this represented the model? There's also, the model is also run at different resolutions, so we can look at explicit convection models, parameterized convection models. So there's a lot of stuff I want to go on to, to look at in, in that vein. Um, and we could also uh, look at more years, more radars, as more radars and more data becomes available to build up a more comprehensive picture. So doing the groundwork in a way with convection operational weather radars is hopefully going to be even more useful with time. Great. Um, so I will um, put this summary up here just to say that um, the monsoon is a vital source of water for over a billion people. So that's why it's important. Uh, convection progressively moistens the troposphere and allows more convection to develop, advancing the monsoon forwards. Um, so that's that Parker hypothesis I spoke about. And ground weather radars 
even operational ground weather radars uh, used for now casting and forecasting can be used to monitor convection, which is especially useful if you have lots of radars to look at different regions. And radars are increasingly common in tropical regions, so this is going to become more and more useful. And we spoke about how the diurnal cycle of convection is different over land and ocean for southeastern India and Mumbai doesn't show much of a down cycle, but shows more in the way of shallow convection. So already we can see how these results in terms of looking at convection with radars tell you something about the meteorology of the region, uh, which I hope you have found really interesting. I saw some questions popping up as I was going through, so I'll, I'll um, try my best to answer them now. Thank you. I, well, having looked at lots of the questions, I almost feel like... <clears throat> Long live the radar nerd. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, let's try and go for the uh, go for the middle. Through them, Rob. Yeah, I'll figure that out in some kind of sensible order. I'm going to start with Williams actually, which was <clears throat> what were, what was the height of the zero uh, what's the height of the zero isotherm in the Indian monsoon in JJA, which was brilliant because I was literally typing that in when it appeared from. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good question and very important um, for several reasons. Um, typically, during the uh, monsoon season in India, it's about five or six kilometers above the surface, uh, the zero degree level. Um, that's important because when we look at convection, when we want to find where convection is using the radar, we look at two kilometer level, which is significantly below that five, six kilometer level, which means um, you know, we're not concerned about the bright band signature, um, for example, from radars um, coming into play there. Um, if you're familiar with the bright band, which of course is uh, forms at the freezing level with radars because of um, the melting of precipitation. Probably less um, of a problem in convection anyway, though. Probably less of a problem in convection as well. Um, but I've had people mention that to me anyway, <laughs> regardless yeah. and certain. You, well, I'll ask yeah. the similar question. Do you ever have a problem with hail? I'm not sure how common hail would be in the monsoon rains. Um, you do get hail. Yes, it's something I've never really thought about. Um, obviously, hail would typically be associated with um, convection. And so you're, um, you know, typically would be associated with very deep convection. It's not something I've really looked at necessarily, but I, I do believe you get hail. Yes, um, quite, quite frequently. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave Len's question till later because I think Len's okay. question is a good one to actually almost end off, end on. Yeah. So but the next one, I'll go for Brian Durham's question. Is, does the Doppler distinguish water from ice in the radar? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, when I say I look at Doppler radars, the funny thing is I, I don't necessarily use the Doppler functionality so much. I'm really only using the, re the, the bog standard reflectivity measurements. Um, it, it's it doesn't, as far as I imagine, I'm happy for Rob to correct me, but I don't believe that um, the radar distinguishes from water and ice. Um, no, I, it's, I it hasn't even, got a way of hasn't got doctor. a way of doing that. Um, the certain radars at India do have um, what's called hydrometeor classification, um, and those radars those radars do distinguish sort of what based on the um, shape of the hydrometeor. Um, do give a vague estimate of what that hydrometeor is. And that's becoming increasingly common in some radars. Um, some of the radars in India do have that functionality. Um, and you, you can look at that, You've yeah. just had a fabulous view of my girlfriend walk past there with her fabulous um, the, the dragonfly onesie on. So she's done well there. Um, <clears throat> so um, next question. Um, well, where am I? Um, what... What reflectivity threshold do you use to define your convective cells and how do you select your threshold? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I'm sorry for not going into more detail, um, no more detail about that. Um, so the threshold is based on, um, I should have said, is based on uh, something called the Steiner algorithm, which is from a paper by, I forget his first name, but a, a fairly famous researcher. Um, called Steiner, who wrote a paper in 1995, which is a very commonly um, uh, used uh, procedure for finding convection using radars, and it splits um, a, a 3D field into convective and, uh, convective and stratiform regions. Um, and the threshold they set was 40 dBZ. Um, they used that for northern Australia during their monsoon season, but for India we decided 
a similar um, sort of meteorological setup. So we use 40 dBz, which is associated with obviously very heavy rain. So we basically know that 40 dBz is convection because that's very heavy rain. Um, so we can be sure that's convection. And then there's also more um, steps which are, are the convection has to be greater by a certain amount than the background, than a certain background radius. And that's why I didn't really go into it because it's quite complicated. Um, Stein in 1995 would be your reference but yes it has to there's also uh, you know values less than 40 dBz can still be considered convective if they're greater than a certain amount than the background radius so it's sort of this idea of peakedness of the reflectivity field yeah sorry I, I muffled my words a bit there but yeah that's the idea right so the um next one is does the uh, PPI of a radar, so basically, really, the question is, does the radar distinguish between drizzle and fog? Um, I doubt drizzle is a big issue in India, but <clears throat> yeah, um, you might want to, you can farm this one off to me if you'd like. Yes, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, Rob would know a lot about this kind of thing. I don't think in the monsoon season in India, drizzle is as common it does happen i imagine and when it does hopefully my convective stratiform split is um not including that drizzle and so hopefully i'm not really looking at it in my convection um but i imagine it does i imagine the radar does um sometimes find drizzle and i imagine it's possible that it isn't able to distinguish between drizzle and fog sometimes but luckily in my work it, it's not so much of a problem that i have to think about because i'm only looking at convection which is cheating a bit but <laughs> well, I guess the, the answer I would say everywhere really is that the radar probably isn't looking low enough most of the time to see fog. Really, if it was close enough to That's see true. fog, yeah. it would hit the ground, and you don't want to hit the ground. Uh, I say you don't want to hit the ground. I don't think my um my, my undergraduate project student that submitted his dissertation last week is here, but he actually did want to look at the ground because we're trying to use the ground as a calibration target. But generally. We're trying to avoid hitting the ground, so yeah, That's you're true. unlikely even, to see even, fog at all. Yeah, and even the lowest elevation angle of 0.2 degrees, um, you know, is at a fair height by the time you get sort of, you know, 10, 20, 30 kilometers out from the radar. It's already a few hundred meters above the surface. Yeah, and and so, you've not, yeah, yeah, you've got the angle yeah. up from it not be, yeah. and also the Earth's curving away underneath it. So indeed, yeah, yeah. you've kind of got two effects going on at once there, right? Um, so I'll go to the Len question that I said I was going to save to the last of the questions um, now. <clears throat> so L Len's question was, will the detail from the radars ever be able to be put into forecast models and not just be used as now casting tools? Which is an excellent question and I kind of wish Lee was here, but you, I'm yeah. sure you know the answer. Yes. <laughs> but uh, it takes a lot of work and uh, as, as Rob mentioned, uh, one of our colleagues Lee um, works with the Met Office it's a really long process um, to do but it can be done and it has been done and of course it's a whole team effort um, people like me hopefully doing the science on it um, uh, and then people later down the down the line at the Met Office and so um, you know then test it and eventually put it into the models but it is unfortunately it takes a long time uh, for obvious reasons um but yeah um it can be done it can be done and that's a, a motivator for me in my project uh, i remind myself of that sometimes that you know it's it, it can it can get to that you can say this work which i've done might get into a model and might actually improve the forecasts um and and that's a nice thought definitely there is, I mean, to some extent, it does already go in to the forecasts. In the, yeah. they have lit latent heat nudging. So where the radar is saying rain is occurring, they've nudged the latent heat in the model to try and help use the radar. But the yeah, Lee Hawkness Smith from the Met Office is working on actually directly assimilating radar reflectivity yeah. taken by the yeah. network. And and the code for that, I believe, is pretty monstrous. It's quite some. <laughs> quite some code let's put it that way um, but yes it, it can be done um right, i'm just checking through the chat to look for any more questions because i've been on looking at questions mode um oh, we, so we so we have a, I, i'm not sure actually how i did it right there we go for that one so what effect does the frequency of cyclones have on the time of the monsoon progression 
So yeah, great question. Things. Yeah, great question. Um, the, the yeah, so Robert might be familiar with uh, monsoon depressions in particular, which are um, a, a type of cyclone that comes off the Bay of Bengal to the east of India, typically, and tracks westwards across into northern India, um, typically uh, regions like Nagpur, which I showed. Um, so those regions do get hit by monsoon depressions, usually a couple of times each monsoon season. Um, and those can um, have been shown in previous research to um, help advance the northern limit of the monsoon. Um, and yeah, can quicken the pace of that northern limit line, which I showed earlier on in the presentation, moving from the southeast to the northwest. Um, yes, they, they can advance the monsoon faster, yeah, because um, sometimes those monsoon depressions occur before the monsoon has arrived in that region, um, which is again goes back to this idea that you can get convection before the monsoon has technically arrived, yeah. Right, I've got one more last question I think here, which I've just marked, so we oh, hit the button. So what's the role of the convective cloud on the retreat of the Indian monsoon? So I can safely say this is one I definitely don't know the answer to. So over to you, Alex, on this one. Yeah, um, that's, that is something I thought about briefly. It's a great question. Um, that might be a future PhD project for someone else. It's its own, um, could be well be its own project. Um, I did discuss that with my supervisors and they basically said, um, the monsoon withdrawal is even more complicated than the monsoon advance. It's even more haphazard. Um, so, um, you know, I spoke about from the southeast to northwest, it's haphazard, but the withdrawal is very difficult to pin down. Um, and so in that sense, it's it would be even more difficult to work out quite what's going on. But I think my guess, my guess would be convection plays a bit less of a role because the withdrawal is more to do with the um, drying of the uh, actually I guess I guess what I'm saying is convection does play a role maybe yes because you get less you get gradually less convection gradually the surface dries um, warms up you get drier air um, coming back from the north and northwest pushing back in um, and that drier air then is what allows the monsoon to gradually withdraw. But as I say, it's a very haphazard process. So in a way, it's a similar thing that the convection is kind of intertwined in, in a way. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. It's a good question. Not my, not my speciality. I, I think that was the end of our questions. So um, on that note, I think we should thank her. We should thank Alex and Simon. We've had lots of chat clapping, obviously, the um, yes, virtual world, it's it. difficult to do some yeah. real clapping. We had no questions about your fabulous experiences of being PhD students stuck at home for a year. So <laughs> I can't imagine that it's quite the experience you were anticipating, but hopefully it's still fun. Hello again, Simon. So um, thank you, both of you. Lots of thumbs ups and claps. I'll give you a visible clap for you. Um, thank, uh, thanks, both of you. Um, there is another meeting in April, so the first Tuesday of April. Simon, I've my brain has gone blank and I've forgotten who April is. So Simon is going to remind it's me. It's Mark McCarthy. Ah, that's right. So Mark McCarthy from the Met Office is our speaker next month. So remember to sign up to get get your demo link. And on that note, I think I shall call a close to the meeting for March. Thank you, everybody, and hopefully I'll virtually see you next month. <laughs>